Let's open our Bibles to Romans in the ninth chapter. We're talking about God in Israel. Romans chapter 9. In these verses, uh, some people want to shy away from these verses because they can be confusing. They can cause you great disturbance when you read them, if you read especially one passage that we're going to deal with this morning. But there are passages that give tremendous hope when you understand what he's talking about here. Now, notice he says in verse 7, he speaks about Abraham, and he says, now, are they all children? Because they are Abraham's descendants, they are not. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. And he speaks of Abraham. I want us to consider choices and promises God has made. Choices and promises. The Bible says here in Romans chapter 9, certain choices he made, and he gives promises to back that up to let us know he's going to fulfill exactly what he said he's going to do. So if you will, turn over to Genesis. Now, hold your place here in Romans, but look in Genesis. We want to look at some verses, all the verses you have in your notes there. We cannot cover all those, but I want to cover some of them. Genesis chapter 12. What did the Lord promise Abraham? Well, these things. And here's a choice he made. He chose to make Abraham a great nation. Look what it says here in these first verses of Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, the Lord's done exactly that. He's made of Abraham a great nation. And it's a miracle that he did this because Abraham, when he had this son that God was going to do this work through, Abraham was 100 years old, and his wife Sarah was 90. I mean, you can't have a child when you're that age. Well, yes, you can if God wants you to. I know you ladies will say, I don't want him to. And uh, Sarah laughed just like you did when she heard, and so did Abram. But God made that promise, and he said that was going to take place, and it most definitely did. But then he didn't stop there. There are other promises that he made. He chose to make Abraham, the father of many nations. Now, look what it says in Genesis chapter 17. In these first five verses, now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord spoke to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me, be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, this wasn't just going to be done through Isaac. This would be done through his son also that he had with Hagar, Sarah's maid, uh, if you'll look down in verse 20 of chapter 17, it says this, As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. And he will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. So here the Lord is told Abraham, so I just... I'm going to bless you, make a nation out of you. There are many nations that are going to come from you. And then God explained to him that the everlasting covenant I make is going to be with you. And it's going to be through your son Isaac, not through Ishmael. The everlasting covenant is going to be with Isaac. Now look what it says, Genesis chapter 17. Look in verse 15. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she'll be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. 
And Abraham fell on his face, and he laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said to him, No, Sarah, your wife will bear you a son, and you will call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So my everlasting covenant is going to come through Isaac. And then it says this, God chose to give Abraham and his descendants through Isaac the Israeli people, a land. And Genesis chapter 12, come back to that chapter, please. Genesis chapter 12. And these verses, beginning in verse 4, Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, on all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Iran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And the Lord appeared, it says in verse 7, to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So God says, here's an unusual thing. I'm promising you, I'm giving you this land of Canaan. And then there's this. Uh, the Bible says a promise was he promised the Messiah was going to come through the lineage of Abraham, then Isaac, and it would be through that lineage. And if you read in Matthew, you don't have to turn to it right now, but in Matthew chapter 1, when he's given the family lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see Abraham's name in there right at the beginning, Isaac, Jacob. You do not see Ishmael's name in there. It's not through his lineage. It's through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that that is going to take place. Now, you know, some people would think, well, now, God, okay, God made that choice of Isaac, so God must not like uh, Ishmael. He, he must be against him. Well, that is, uh, that is not the case. Look in Genesis chapter 21. And uh, here Sarah had made the mistake when she thought she would never be able to have a child. She said, here, Abraham, here's my maid, Hagar. You take her, have a child with her. Well, that did happen. And uh, that was not real happy after it occurred. Well, then... God does this miracle and gives Isaac through Sarah. Abraham and Sarah conceive. And it says here in verse 21, Sarah then turns on Hagar. See, she saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, mocking. And this did not sit well with her, not in the least. And so she says, if you look in Genesis 21 in verse 10, she says to Abraham, I want you to get this maid out of here. Drive her and her son. Get them away, for this son of the maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Well, that distressed Abram. This was his son, and it says he was concerned, greatly concerned because of this. But God said to him, now don't be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be made, named. And the son of the maid, I will make a nation also, and because he is your descendant. And then you read further down the page, here Hagar's in a desperate situation, and she's there, she's just crying. She thought she was in a world of hurt. But it says in verse 17, God heard the lad crying, and an angel of the Lord called out to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter with you, Hagar? Do not fear. God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, hold him by the hand, for I'm going to make a great nation of him. And so don't read this. Okay, God chose Isaac, so he must not like uh, Ishmael at all. No, he's going to make a great nation out of Ishmael. And then you read another passage. Now look over here in Romans chapter 9, and this is a passage that just bothers the life out of so many people. Because it says God not only made a choice there of Isaac over Ishmael for this everlasting covenant, 
But then he makes the choice that you're going to read of right here. It says in verse 10, uh, not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, one father, Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, I said, the older will serve the younger. Okay, that's not a problem. But the next verse is, as it is written, find this in Malachi, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Whoa, what do you do with that? Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. Some people read that verse and just they get so upset with God. Is that saying that the eternal God has hatred in his heart? Like sinful man has hatred toward another human being? You know, there's a lot of hatred in the world. There's a lot of hatred in our country. Some people just despise other individuals. They detest them. They hate them. Well, when it says, Jacob, I love thee, so I hate it, is God like that? And if, he, if you think he is, then you have some major problems because what in the world do you do when God incarnate, Christ comes into the world, God in the flesh, and he says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Now, I'm about to read that and think, with the exception of Esau, God loved the whole world, but he hated Esau. And then what about in the uh, teachings where Jesus was asked about the greatest commandments? And Jesus said, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor means everyone. You, you hate the sin, but you love the, those who are sinful. When he says you love yourself, then you're having to love the sinful. And then love other people. You love all people. Whoops, with the exception of Esau. Is God in the flesh going to stand there and say, God so loved the world? And then you're to love your neighbor as yourself and yet have in his heart, well, there's one guy I hate. I hate Esau. No, that's not the meaning. It does not mean that God hates in the way that a sinful human being hates. Let me show you a verse. Look over here in Luke, Luke's gospel. In chapter 14, in verse 24, or 25, Luke chapter 14, in verse 25, and the Lord Jesus is speaking, and it says, now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus, I'm so confused. You tell me the great commandments, I'm to love all people, I'm to love myself. And then you come along in this verse and you're saying, if you don't hate your father, your mother, your brothers, your sister, your husband, your wife, even your own life, you can't be my disciple? Lord, I don't, I don't know what to do here. Well, when he's saying hate, it's not meaning that you do not love and care for your family. Of course, throughout the Bible, it talks about how husbands are to love and cherish their wives and nourish them. Wives are to love their husbands. We're to love our children. We're to love people. When that word is used here in this verse in Luke 14, and then when it's used in Romans, it means I prefer, I prefer Jacob over Esau. And he's saying here in this passage, the relationship more so than any other in life that you are to prefer that's to be most important to you is your relationship with the Lord Jesus. That is to be more important than your relationship with your wife, with your children, with your grandkids, with your relatives, with people. And you'll find this to be true. If you love him supremely and make him first, you will love your family and other people much more than you ever would 
if you put Christ out of your life. So that's what he's saying. He's not saying, I hate in the way that sinful man hates, not in the least. God does not. He loves. He preferred. He made his choice. I'm going to do this through Isaac and through Jacob, not through Ishmael, not through Esau. That's all that means. But God had promised the Messiah is going to come through that lineage, and that's exactly what happened. Jesus Christ came through Abraham's family lineage, through Isaac and Jacob. And then he did this. He promised salvation was by faith. Now look what it says. Come back over here to Romans chapter 9. Salvation is by faith all the way through the Scripture. This is underscore. But look in verse 30 and uh, following. Romans chapter 9, and he says this. What shall we then say? that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. He said, Jesus Christ wasn't even here yet. The revelation that God gave of himself, Abraham put his faith in him. And God could honor that faith because he knew what he was going to do in Christ on the cross. But he was saved by faith. Romans chapter 4 explains that. But here, the Lord's telling us right here, the righteousness which is by faith. But then he says, here's the problem. Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. But you don't believe in him. Reject Christ. You're going to stumble over him. That's exactly what Israel did. But God made the promise. And he said salvation is going to come by faith, faith in Christ. And then he promised one other thing. He promised there would be a remnant of Israel saved. Look what it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it's the remnant that will be saved. Now, some people, and when we get over to Romans chapter 11, you're going to see a verse in Romans 11 that it says at the end, all Israel will be saved. And some people take that to mean that all Jewish people of all times will be saved. They will not be. These people in the time of Christ, when Jesus came into the world and he preached to them and they rejected him and they died in their sins, they will not be saved. He's talking about a remnant. God never promised that all Jews would be saved. He said there will be a remnant who will be saved. But those are the choices. Those are the promises that God has made. Well, what in the world does that mean to us? Well, one thing, just a couple things I'd mention to you. One is this. Uh, God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. Now, sometimes we get to a place in life where we, uh, we think he doesn't. Or we think he hasn't made any promise to me. You think, well, these are all promises to Abraham, and it's all about Israel. Well, listen, there's a the nation of Israel, but there's spiritual Israel, as we saw last week. Spiritual Israel are followers of Christ, whether they be Jew or whether they be Gentile. And just like God had made promises to Abraham concerning the nation of Israel, God has made promises to spiritual Israel. That's you if you know Christ as Savior. And here's what you need to know. He keeps his promises. He keeps them. He's not going to renege on one promise that he has made to you in your life as a believer. Not once will he do that. You know, throughout Israel's history, uh, so many times they were questioning God. I think of Gideon and Judges. And the Lord comes to Gideon. It was a hard time, very hard time. And the Lord comes to him. And it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Judges chapter 6 and verse 12. And he said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And Gideon didn't feel like any valiant warrior. He was all beat down. But the Lord knew the plans that he had for him. You may be beat down in your life. And you need to stop and think, though, what, what's the Lord say about me, not what do I feel about myself? Gideon probably felt like a failure or a loser, like nothing good was going to happen. The Lord comes to him and says, Gideon, 
O valiant warrior. And then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, because the Lord had just told him, the Lord's with you. He says, well, if the Lord's with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now, Lord, the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And we've heard about all these miracles, and I'd like to just see one, Lord. Where are all these miracles? Uh, you're not keeping your word here. That's what Gideon thought. And the Lord explained to him things he was going to do. God had not broken his promises to them. But don't you know many times through Israel's history, for the Jewish people, they could have thought that. Remember when they were ushered into captivity into Babylon? And the Lord says, you're going to be there for 70 years. Well, that was their own fault because they chose to sin and rebel against the Lord. He said, you're going to be there 70 years. Well, not all those people who went into captivity in Babylon lived through the whole 70 years. Some of those people died. And when the Lord, he'd already told them through Jeremiah, after 70 years, I'm bringing you back to the land. Some of those people who died, they could have thought, this isn't going to happen. We've lived our lives here for 20, 30, 40 years, and now I'm dying, and God said he was bringing his face. It's not going to happen, but it did. 70 years when it's up, God brings them back. And then what about in the time of Christ? When Jesus comes, he goes to the house of Israel first, and he preaches to them, and he preached to Gentiles. He preached to everyone. But the Jewish people would have nothing to do with him, the vast majority of them. And the Bible says Jesus looked out over Jerusalem, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you to myself as a hen gathers her brood, but you were unwilling. Now your house is left to you desolate. And what Christ said, that occurred. Forty years later, the Romans came in under Titus and devastated Jerusalem. Jews were dispersed scattered all over the world. And they stayed that way for hundreds and hundreds of years. And don't you know those people could have thought to themselves, you're not keeping your promise. You said you're giving us this land. We're, we're scattered everywhere. But then something unusual began to happen. Listen, Jerusalem became the capital city when David was the king. Over 3,000 years ago, David declared Jerusalem the capital city of Israel. And then for the past 2,000 years, uh, that land has been occupied by all sorts of different people, none of which ever declared Jerusalem as the capital city. But there's always been just a handful of Jews that lived in Jerusalem, and they always said, Jerusalem is our eternal capital. But then, in the 1900s, strange things began to occur because Jews started going back to the promised land. And not just with a few hundred, a few thousand, there are about a, over a million living in Jerusalem now and over nine million living in that country. Listen, it, it became so populated. In 1948, Harry Truman, the president of the United States, declared Israel a nation. Well, in 1948, there was the war for independence with the Jordanians. And there was some trouble there because one part of Jerusalem was captured by the Jordanians, and they held out for a period of time. But in 1967, there was a six-day war, and that land, that part of Jerusalem was taken back. It was reunified, reunited, and now it is declared the capital of Israel. And the people are in that land. I don't know if you even pay attention to that. I'm telling you, this is a miracle of God. It's un unbelievable. The way they're hated and detested, if Iran could do it right now, they'd blow up Israel. They'd destroy. They'd kill every Jew. And yet there they sit in that land. And God has made his promise. 
So I'm just saying to you and I in our lives, sometimes as believers, we get like Gideon or we think like the people of the Israeli clan could think. We think, God, you're not doing this. I've got hard times in my life. You're not keeping your promises to me. You said you'd work all things for good. You said you'd always be with me, and I don't think you are. You need to quit going by your feelings and go by what he says in his word. He's promised you he's with you. He's promised you he will work all things for good. He's promised if you respond to him in faith, he will guide you. He will respond to your prayers. He keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. But then there's one final thing that I would just mention. It's this. The fact that it's Israel is back in the land that God had promised, it reveals that a crucial prophetic event has occurred that paves the way for the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. You know, some people don't want to hear about the return of Christ because they're so comfortable in their life right now. And I'm talking about believers. They don't want to think about Christ coming now. They want to think, hey, let me live till about 90 or 95, really enjoy my life, and then you can come. But right now I'm enjoying myself. And so they're not interested in Christ coming. That's a mistake. Now, I know some young people could think to themselves, well, I've got my whole life before me here in this world. Well, listen, you don't know what's coming in the world. You see all the things that are occurring, and some just think, I don't want Christ to come back right now. But Jesus talked about signs of the time because they asked him. Look in Matthew's gospel in chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And they were saying this, they, they were walking out of the temple area. And they said to the Lord Jesus, they're pointing out all the temple buildings. They get so fascinated with buildings, just like people do today. Wow, look at all this. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? And Christ said, well, all right. Now they're asking a couple of different questions there. But here he deals with about his return. He says, see that no one mislead you because there are going to be plenty that try to do that. He said, many are going to come in my name saying I am the Christ and will mislead many. You're going to be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that's not yet the end. He said, nation's going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famines and earthquakes. And all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. Nobody wants to hear that. Believers want to think it's going to get better and better and better. The Bible says it's not. He says they're going to deliver you to tribulation. You'll be killed. Some are dying today because of their faith in Christ. You will be hated. That's sinful mankind's hate. By all nations because of my name, at that time, many will fall away. You know, a lot of people who may come to church and may say they're a Christian, well, you find out. You'll find out. Because some of these, when that begins to happen, are going to vanish. They want nothing to do with Christ. He says, uh, many are going to betray one another. They will hate one another. False prophets will arise and mislead many. Lawlessness is increased. Are we seeing that? Uh, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. He said, this gospel is going to be preached into all the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. But there's one other thing, and he goes ahead and he talks about certain things occurring, but in the Old Testament especially, prophetic messages are given in regard to Israel. And before Christ comes back, it lets us know that they're going to be in that land. Look in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. And here's what is given to the prophet. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, houses plundered, women ravished, half the city exiled, but the rest of people will not be cut off from the city. 
Then the Lord will go forth and fight against all the nations as when he fights on the day of battle. In that day, talking now about the coming of Christ, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from the east to the west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half move toward the south. And then it says, look in verse 7 and verse 6. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. It will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In the day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name, the only one. But when Christ comes back, people of Israel have to be in that land. And it says specifically here, when he comes back, he's not landing in Dallas. He's not landing in New York City, Washington, D.C. He'll be landing in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. So all these signs, I don't know when Christ is coming back, but I'm just saying all the signs that Jesus speaks of and prophetic signs are occurring right now in the world. We're, we're close. Now, could that be 50 years, five years, 100? I don't know. But we would be foolish to say, oh, I don't say anything. Life will go on as it always has. That's just not true. It won't. Christ's coming could be very quick. So the question is, if that occurs, will you be ready for that? Will you be ready for that event? If Jesus Christ were to come today, are you ready? You're not if you don't know Christ. You know, in Matthew, those verses we just read, throughout Matthew chapter 24, he is stressing to them. He said, you need to be on the alert, be ready. Look at, look at the statement he makes here in verse 42 of Matthew 24. He said, be on the alert. For you do not know which day the Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is faithful and sensible? Whoever is a slave like that whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will be put in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming, he's not coming for a long time. I can do whatever I want to do. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces, sign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then right on the heels of that, in the very next verses, he gives a parable to ten virgins. He said five were prepared, five were not prepared. Then the bridegroom came. And the five who were unprepared, they go to those who are prepared, and they're trying to get help from them. It's too late. It's too late. Listen, when Jesus Christ comes back, it's not going to take him 15 minutes to get down here. It's a split second. It's too late if a person has not made their peace with God. So I look here in Romans chapter 9, and I see all these promises that he made to Abraham and how he kept them. And it just remind me, he's the great promise keeper to us. But I also see the prophetic message that one of the key events that has to have occurred for the stage to be set for Christ's return, Israel has to be back in the land God promised them. And that's exactly where they are. Christ is coming, and he may come soon. Are you ready? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, it's the blessed hope of the world that you're coming back. This is a sinful, wicked world, and no matter what happens, it's not going to get better because man continues to reject you 
and their sinful deeds. We can build elaborate, beautiful buildings and we can do these spacecrafts and all of that, but man is sinking deeper and deeper into sin, just like you said. The Lord Jesus, thank you that doesn't go on forever. Thank you that you are coming. And the Lord Jesus, when you do, for those of us who are believers, it's a glorious day. And Father, I just pray for believers who are listening to this. They'd be encouraged by this, but I pray for people who do not know you, whether they're in this room or whether they're watching by live stream. The Lord Jesus, they get real serious and understand their eternal destiny hangs on what they do with you. Will they receive you or reject you? I pray, Lord, they'll trust you. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, many of you are believers, but I don't know about everyone in this room or all the people watching by live stream, but I would just say to any who is not trusted in Christ, I hope you'll just, maybe you've blown thoughts like this off, just blown them off in the past. It's all foolishness. That's just preacher talk. No, this is Jesus talk. This is Bible talk. And I, I just pray Christ can bring a seriousness to your life sober you up spiritually and help you to understand more than anything else in life, I need him. And if you want to give your life to him, you can do that right now. If you need to make that commitment, I hope that you will. If you need to talk with me, I'll be right here at the front when this is over. If you're watching by live stream, please contact us. We have information there for you. Let us know. We want to help you in any way that we can. God bless you.